Thanks for joining us for The Agronomists. Tonight's show is brought to you by The Corn School, our Real Ag newsletters, and Adama Canada. By listening to you and remaining unapologetically crop protection, we leverage the world's largest library of actives to provide innovative solutions to your greatest challenges. Tell your Adama sales rep what you're looking for today. Yes, good evening, everyone. I am Lindsay Smith. I am your host, and we started on time. Uh, so if I've caught a few of you off guard, no worries. Welcome here. We've got a whole hour ahead of us uh, to chat and catch up. Um, so yes, we started on time. And mostly that's because of my two great guests who I'll bring in in just a moment. Uh, but they have been on the ball. We've got some great visuals, uh, some great clips to go over tonight. Uh, and uh, they were actually online before I was. So hats off to them. Uh, uh, before, of course, we get to tonight's show, a quick reminder, if you do collect those CEU credits, head on over to realagriculture.com slash agronomists tomorrow. Let us know you took in the show and we'll get you those credits. Uh, hello to Jason in Manitoba and, of course, to Kevin out in BC. I hope uh, you're staying safe out that way. And hello to Ray in Calgary, who last week, I believe, was also sizzling. I don't know about this week. Um, it is. It has been a bit of a wild week um, here in Ontario. It uh, we got downright cool over some nights, and that actually is one of the things we're going to bring up tonight about corn development. So yes, tonight's topic: corn diseases. Uh, please get your questions in. Oh, and Peter's here. Hello, Peter. Uh, we're going to focus uh, quite a bit on tar spot, of course, because that's a new one. But we're going to talk gibberella, likely some other corn leaf bite as well. So get your <laughs> questions in early. All right, let's bring in our experts for tonight. I've got Mr. Dale Cowan with Agris Co-op. And John Saliga with Corteva, John's first time on the show. Welcome here, Dale and John. Okay, thank you, Lindsay. Nice to thank be you. here. All right. So, uh, yes, thank you both, and thanks for being uh, so on time and on the ball for tonight's show. I'm pretty excited about this one. Okay, so let's start with uh, you're both based in Ontario. Let's start with where we're at. Here we are, hard to believe, uh, nearing the end of August. Uh, John, for your area, how are the crops looking? Well, the crops look actually quite good. Um, corn uh, indications are from uh, information that I've been getting from the field as of late and would suggest that uh, we're looking at a very good corn crop and and beans as well. I mean, obviously, there's, uh, there's a few sore spots in the territory that I cover, but all in all, right now, things are things are looking pretty good. Okay, Dale. Yeah, similar. Dale. I can echo similar things. Uh, our corn is is averaged above average. I don't think it's going to set any yield records, but it looks strong. And the beans, uh, if we can ever get a break from heavy rain, there's there's some sore spots in beans, as John said, uh, just too much water. But I'm surprised at the recovery of some of these beans, and so they uh, we have seem to have reasonable pod set, regional number of beans in the pod. So they're they're doing their thing. The cold nights start to concern me a little bit with the beans, though. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, and is some of those source spot is it white mold that's really taking hold, or or is it the root rots that are sort of showing their ugliness here? Uh, <clears throat> early on, early on, certainly we had some root rots, and we saw some fusarium root rot. In a number of situations, uh, I had a number of calls on that, and but as of late, there's definitely uh, definitely some great examples of white mold out there. You can mm. you can you can find that white mycelia in a lot of places, and it probably hasn't fully expressed itself yet, mm. but it it will in in time. Yeah, Dale, same story. Yeah, well, where we see white mold is in the rotation with uh, vegetable crops that have high fertility, high uh, growth potential. So that's a perennial thing for us is, you know, say, for example, after tomato rotation, we're always going to find white mold, just lush growth. Yeah. Uh, have some fields were fairly spotty and the areas where the beans were very growthy. We have a technology to turn the sprayer on there and shut it off where there's no beans. So a few people did that and that seemed to have paid and some others gave up on the crop and we seem to have some uh, some areas of white mold showing up. And like John said, it's uh, remains to be seen how, how uh, severe it becomes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, Peter Johnson notes edible beans are perhaps a bit of a sore spot 
uh, as well. Yes, not looking their best at this point. Uh, and Mark joining us as well, uh, seeing some anthracnose in corn. Now, Mark is south of us. Um, and uh, so seeing some anthracnose, so that's interesting. Um, now, Peter, this is supposed to be about corn diseases. And he's asking about white mold fungicides. But okay, we'll allow it because it's Peter Johnson. Uh, but early indications, Dale, let's say, as you said, turning the sprayer on, off, early indications seem to be positive that... Uh, that where it was needed, it's doing a good job, but uh, not necessarily needed end to end? It's always a question, always look at disease in terms of what's the incidence and what's the severity? How, how often is it showing up and how severe is it going to become? And unfortunately our sprays are all preventative and it means good coverage. So if you're getting the spray down in the canopy where the flower petals are, uh, probably better um, with a decent water volume and decent pressure. If that's not the case, then to answer his question, we're probably not seeing as much efficacy as we'd like. Mm -hmm. Now, John, Kevin here, he's out in BC and sound, he says, it sounds like a couple of cornfields in our area have a spider mite infestation. Have you ever heard of spider mites in corn? Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> yeah. We don't, we don't wow. see it a lot, but, and it's certainly been much too wet in our environment for, for spider mite to be a concern, but I've definitely witnessed it and to say that we pulled a trigger on a, you know, on a spray program to deal with it. I, I can't honestly say that we've ever done that in my, in my territory. I don't know. Maybe Dale, Dale has seen that. We, we see it next to a harvested wheat fields uh, when it's dry, the spider mites will move in there, but it's only the first two or three rows of corn. You don't, they don't go any further. So it's just not justifiable economically. So it looks awful, uh, but it's really not something that you can justify spraying, at least in my opinion, anyways. So. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Kevin, maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you are in a, a very dry spell this year. Typically gets lots of good moisture. He's out in BC um, in the Fraser Valley. So, so I'm going to assume and I think he mentioned it last week that he is quite dry. Um, and Jason Volt uh, out of Manitoba says yes in corn uh, and even saw some in spring wheat as well with the spider mites. So, yeah. So, definitely. Okay. I had, I don't think I'd ever heard about it in corn. Um, but there you go. Uh, okay. Let's, um, let's switch gears a little. I think we'll probably start with tar spot if only because maybe that's um, top of mind. But I, I will say... I don't want us to forget about all the other things that we do need to talk about because I know that tar spot is the newish one. I know it's the one that perhaps we're trying to learn the most about, uh, but I certainly don't want to ignore all the other diseases that we have to uh, we have to worry about. So actually, before we start on tar spot, that's actually where I want to start. John, you shared uh, some of the risk maps uh, earlier today with us. Uh, Producer Jay, if you could bring those up. Um, <coughs> because we've got lots of good questions about spray efficacy and all those sorts of things, which we are absolutely going to get to. We've got some great visuals for that as well. But first, let's look at risk. Um, and I think we've got four different diseases here. I'm not quite sure. But Jay, if you could bring that up, uh, we'll go through some of these. All right. So, John, I'll, I'll let you take it away uh, on on some of these. But uh, hmm. I like how, how much geography we're covering here, John. You're very well, inclusive. Well, and, and of course, these are uh, these are risk maps that are that are built uh, by our company using obviously using models that are utilizing essentially temperature and humidity and that is a way or a function to extrapolate leaf wetness uh, obviously leaf wetness sensors would be ideal but we don't have a you know a good enough coverage with leaf wetness sensors <clears throat> to do something like this but but this certainly is a tool or these are tools we can use to at least identify uh, areas where we should be getting out to scout, right? And first and foremost, uh, scouting is what needs to happen when it comes to managing diseases because uh, you need to see what's going on in your particular field. Um, if if you look at this map now i'm colorblind so this isn't a great map for me but <clears throat> but for those that are not colorblind uh they will they will be able to differentiate kind of the low medium high risk areas across to, across north america and this is a nice 
a, a nice indication of, of kind of what we're facing in the Ontario region in, in regards to northern corn leaf blight. And of course, we have different models for each of the diseases. Uh, if you want to <coughs> just slide ahead, you'll see uh, examples for coarse gray leaf spot. Uh, and just, I'll make a comment on gray leaf spot. I, I would say that in the last five or so years, I, I've seen fairly good frequency of gray leaf spot in fields in Ontario that I've walked. They, they rarely are of concern from a spray standpoint, but, uh, but we definitely see that disease here. Okay. And then if you go forward one more, you'll see, of course, the, uh, the hot topic at hand, the nice new shiny disease tar spot, and you'll see the risk profile there. And there, there is some elevate, <clears throat> elevated risk here in southwestern Ontario. And we're seeing the disease in the field, right? So, <clears throat> yeah. Now, Dale, looking at that, that looks pretty accurate to you as far as the, the risk? Well, it's it certainly this is what the models are telling us. And, and I think in addition to the models, the other things that we advise our customers on is the high risk environment, uh, corn on corn, high yield environment, susceptible hybrids, uh, no till where you got the trash on the on the surface, which is the source of the inoculum for an awful lot of these fungal pathogens. Um, rain in the forecast two weeks uh, before and after uh, VT and R1. And so these things build up the risk level even more. So these maps are nice uh, risk model assessment to say that kind of supports the, some of the observations. Uh, I don't think they're meant to be, oh, we have high risk, go spray. I think what they're telling you to okay. do is go scout, right? Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Um, John, I'll have you know the colors look great. So you may not That's be good. able to see them. Thank, yeah. thank you for but clarifying. They, but they look great. So there you go. Uh, my father's also colorblind. Uh, he can't tell the difference between blue, brown, and green. And so my mother never let him get dressed to go anywhere nice on his own because yeah, he would just come out with atrocious outfits. So there you go. Nice. Um, okay, so now Peter brings up a question. It's one thing I wanted to follow up on this. Um, with those maps, mm -hmm. does that assume um, that there's inoculum there? So um, that is, of course, and we can talk about that disease triangle. We love our disease triangle. Um, are we sort of assuming that those are the con it does that map just say the conditions are conducive or are that is that actually mapping incidents as well meaning we know that the disease is there i i would <clears throat> i would say that that's suggesting that the conditions are conducive okay. and if and if you're in southwestern ontario you have the host and you have okay. the inoculum we we know that we have the inoculum now in southwestern ontario so it's a it's a yeah. matter of whether the environment's going to support yeah. infection of the plant, and then is the environment going to support further spread of that infection? Okay, yeah. perfect. Yeah, yep. these these diseases are all endemic in our soils. They, we don't need them to blow in anymore from anywhere. We've got them ourselves. So you know, but it's nice. It's nice to share, Dale. There you go. Actually, that was one of the things I wanted to clarify is that, um, as specifically with tar spot will now it may move by wind but do we just assume that we will have enough that is in in uh, in ontario soils or residue now do we just assume that it is potentially present regardless of spore load that comes in on the breeze well it depends on the field i talked about one thing i didn't mention was the history of your field if you got a history and we we're starting to build a history with tar spot now after three or four years so so no, that, that, let's not discount storm fronts moving up the Ohio Valley. They bring spores. So, I mean, that's how tar spot got here in the first place. Okay. Uh, you know, it came, well, we think it came from up through the Midwest or across from Michigan. Doesn't really matter. It's here. But yeah, that's how things get here originally on the wind and uh, they get here quite quickly on the wind. So, mm -hmm. but okay. as, as John said, whether they infect or not is what are the conditions that support the infection. So. Okay. Okay, absolutely. So um, some really good questions on spray efficacy. And I, I do want to get to some of those. Um, but perhaps before we do that, um, let's talk just about overall sort of risk that because uh, I think Dale, you've got a good uh, photo of a um, spray miss. So just showing essentially what uh, what 
the infection level could look like for mm -hmm. those areas that that uh, did spray um, and what that is. So, Jay, if you can bring up, um, I think it's the second one that Dale sent. Sorry, yeah, I should have looked at the numbers, Producer Jay. Yeah, there we go. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so th this is a leaf. So this field was sprayed with a helicopter, and I'm not trying to say that helicopter is bad. Helicopters can't get in the corners next to tall trees or hydro towers or windmills. So they pull up, right? They don't want to crash. So this is a little corner in a field that got missed. And this was sprayed three weeks ago. So this gives you an idea that we found one or two lesions on the leaf below the ear. And here's three weeks later. This shows you how fast this disease moves. That's what they call a polycyclical disease. You have the stroma that makes spores and those spores make more stroma and those stroma make more spores and the way it goes so it just this this corn looks like it's end of october already and it's just mm -hmm. uh just not even september yet so it just shows you how, how extent so this was a mess in a field i can't honestly say i've seen enough uh differences between ground rigs and helicopter to say one's better over the other i see as, as good an efficacy on either one it's a question of uh misses in corners and misses around trees. And we see that with ground rigs. And sometimes a ground rig wanders a little bit and tramples some corn. So it's always, there's always trade off and compromises. So um, I wouldn't say that uh, I do ground rig only. Uh, sometimes we simply have to get across the acres in a very short time frame, And so we need all the services. We, we, you know, it's only recently we've built up our ground rig capacity and we really need to count on air, especially the tar spot. To get the fields mm -hmm. covered in a hurry so yeah john are you seeing are you seeing some of the similar sort of in the misses you're seeing higher infection uh <clears throat> absolutely yeah i and and i don't you cannot you you cannot minimize how fast this disease can progress it it it, it really it's stunning and in 2021 when we first really got a got a look at it we we had a plot just outside of pancor and by the middle of september there there were essentially two hybrids left with a couple of green leaves on the plant at the top everything else was completely senesced yeah and and, and i think what <coughs> you know what we're learning in time is like from a from a hybrid resistance or tolerance standpoint is there's there's resistance or tolerance to infection but then there's this play on leaf senescence and there's a there's differences between hybrids in terms of how quickly the actual senescence occurs some some products and and some germplasm has the ability to to get infected by stroma and yet continue to maintain enough green leaf tissue to continue to photosynthesize. Uh, do, do we completely understand this? Absolutely not. And, and we're still building a database on it. But that's one of the things that we're noticing uh, as we, you know, assess and score plots. So, Dale, walk me through how important it has become when you're working with your clients, perhaps on hybrid selection and those sorts of things. Is it relatively easy to navigate tar spot resistance or tolerance within what we have out there or, or are we still at sort of the beginning of this well, on, the, well, on think, the on the hybrid side i think we're still at the beginning we only started looking at hybrids in basically 2021 2022 it takes a while to uh yeah. to score and rank them and um yeah so i don't not saying we'll never get there i'm just saying you know we only got to give ear rot susceptibility ratings two years ago. So uh, tar mm -hmm. spots on top of that now. So I, I think we'll get there eventually. As John says, we, we see differences in hybrids, no question. Um, yeah. So we just have to, to get there. And, and uh, certainly farmers need to know what their risks are when they're buying seed corn. So I'm certainly hope mm -hmm. that we can get there shortly. John, do you know, has that has tar spot moved up as far as the importance in, in hybrid selection? Would you know from your company's perspective? On, oh, on sort of what the focus becomes oh a absolutely yeah i know the uh the the breeders the breeders have a pretty significant focus on on tar spot and and we're utilizing our uh you know both our internal research plots as well as our what we call our product knowledge plots 
that each of the sales reps would put out, we're using those to collect information on on a yearly basis, trying to accelerate mm -hmm. what we know about the hybrids. And then of course the breeders are using that to understand the inbred part of the mix so that right. they can work on developing uh, newer, stronger products. I, in, in the case, not to get off a tar spot, but just to mention, you know, Northern Corn Leaf Light, there's, we do have identified genes of resistance, the HT genes. I, I would fully expect that in time, we're going to find or identify genes that will be able to support some level of tolerance uh, to this disease uh, in the tar spot world. Of course, um, I'm not a breeder, though. So. Right. I, I just sort of, you know, assume that everyone just gets brand new hybrids every single year. I mean, isn't it that quick? You just sort of swap them out and away you go. You got brand new ones, right? Not quite. Um, but it is quicker than than some, let's say. Uh, so Pete sort of follows up with that. Um, are there good so sources of resistance in the corn genome? So I guess this is, we do know um, certainly that uh, we already are finding differences between hybrids. Um, so are, are we quite confident that we've got some existing uh, resistance, some good resistance? I, I'm not a breeder, Lindsay, and, and Peter knows I'm not a breeder. I, I think the fact that there's differences between hybrids suggests that there's enough variation in the germplasm that we should be able yeah. to, the breeders will start, will start selecting for that and they will make progress like they have done on so many other, other diseases. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the, ahead, the seed Jeff. business, seed business is very competitive. So, uh, everybody's working on this. So, working uh, hard. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, so it's, it's, it's not, it's not back burner by any stretch. Northern corn leaf blight uh, has been top of mind for seed companies for quite some time. Cause we started to see, uh, susceptibility creep in on, on the current, on the current genetics. So, yeah. And we can't forget about Northern current leaf blight. It's, That's it's right. still out there. So. It's still out there. Um, okay. So let's, on that note, we are, we've got a bit of a clip here uh, that looks at some of the different uh, fungicide timing um, and uh, in for control of tar spot. So we'll, we'll go to this clip um, and hear another sponsor read before we sort of dig in a little bit more on tar spot. And of course, talk to Jibarella as well. So we're going to look at four different plots here. We're going to look at tar spot development and control on a more tolerant hybrid. And you'll notice tar spot being here. It's significantly less than what we see on our susceptible hybrid. And we're going to look at how fungicide application, different timings impact tar spot management. So here we are, this is our fungicide check. We see the tar spot is basically from the bottom leaves all the way up to the top. This is our standard. And we could say that we are looking at 20, 25% tar spot in this particular plot. So now we've moved over to the pre-tassel fungicide application timing. So a lot of questions around that eight to 10 leaf stage or so. And we can see here that we've got tar spot, we've got tar spot down low, we've got it moving up the canopy as well. Maybe slightly less tar spot than we saw in our untreated check, but again, there's quite a bit of tar spot here, um, and I don't think we'll see a big difference in terms of yield. Now, we're at different plot, same fungicide though, different timing. This is our more traditional VTR1 fungicide application timing. It's been the most consistent we've seen for tar spot, for gibberell ear rot, and other foliar leaf diseases. We can see less tar spot here. We see northern corn leaf blight that came in later in here as well, as we saw in others. But again, we see less tar spot here. It's The fungicide is working. This is one of our more effective fungicides. It's doing its thing. So we can see a mark, remarkable difference from those pre-tassel to untreated check to that BTR1. So final stop on our tour today is double application here. So we did a VTR1 application, followed that three weeks later around that R3 hybrid or, or growth stage here. Again, same fungicide, effective fungicide against tar spot. And we can see out of the four plots, this one has the least amount of visible tar spot, not only down low, but above as well. So we've got that extension of the 
the window where we've got a longer window of control for tar spot, the question becomes, although we see less tar spot here than compared to some of the other ones, does it pay to have this fungicide double application? Does it pay? We haven't taken the yield yet. Tonight's show is brought to you by Adam of Canada, Real Egg Newsletters, and The Corn School. Big corn yields demand intense management. From tillage strategies to nitrogen management, variety selection, pest management, and more, Real Agriculture's Corn School is a video series that tackles every facet of the corn growing season in an engaging and informative format. The Corn School is made possible by support from BASF and Pride Seeds. Learn more at cornschool.com. So, begs the question, John, I'll start with you. When is the ideal time to spray for tar spot? If I'm in high risk, I've looked at my field history, I'm scouting, is there an ideal window? Uh, as of today, based on what we know and the experience that we've had, uh, certainly that, that VT to R1 timing uh, seems to be the most effective uh, at controlling the majority of the infection. But with diseases, it's so dependent on what the environment's like 20 days after you apply mm -hmm. that, uh, that fungicide. It's, it's not a forever type control, right? right? Uh, there's... There, there needs to be more work on it, but I, and I, I don't expect it to change a lot in time, but today that would be it. Dale, are you a go, go in again? After well, I, could that? Just, I would just chicken out and say, I agree with John, but uh, no, John made good. You're not allowed. John, no, you, you <laughs> need to add to that, Dale. <laughs> well, so it depends on who the customer is. So if I'm, if I'm dealing with a, a hog farmer, uh, my first concern is a good ear rot. I don't care what the black the tar spots are doing in the area. I'm going to protect right. for Gibby Rop. That's my primary. We also know, according to Albert, that does a pretty good job on stopping tar spot. This year, we're two weeks behind. We got nice green corn. We're barely in the milk stage. We're certainly not in the dough stage yet. We got mm -hmm. quite a bit of skating to do on this corn crop. We won't see black layer here until the first week of October. So what happens when... We start to run out of the first application. You know, we're getting, we're getting some fields that are now four weeks post application of the first fungicide. So what happens if the tar spot and nothing kicks up? We're still packing on a lot of yield at R3, R4. Like we're not at black layer yet. So, so we have a few progressive farmers are not waiting on Albert. They've gone out already and put in some check strips, uh, three or four in a field just to see what happens. And they'll soon know whether it pays or not. And uh, so that's the kind of stuff that we need to help augment our knowledge base is a few progressive farmers willing to go try stuff like that. So, so I don't know exactly, but uh, John made the point earlier, we got to be in the fields. We got to spend time in the field observing and seeing what's going on and, and seeing if that stroma is developing again on the leaves that have already been sprayed. That'd be pretty obvious if it is. So most fungicides, the new ones that we're talking about are probably after four weeks starting to get a little thin. So we could very well, if it's going to be a year, I think uh, the U.S. Midwest had one year where they sprayed twice. I'm not so sure that it paid. So, well, we're kind of some uncharted water here with, with, with tar spot in this kind of season. So I think we have a risk, but uh, I don't think the risk means go out and spray your second pass. I think go out and observe, see what you see. Mm -hmm. John, and with the, with the, let's say slow season that corn is having it, dale brings up a good point we we are looking at potentially a crop that is is a little behind or maybe perhaps just not roaring to the finish here but it seems to be a little slow going uh if temperatures cool off um are we looking at you know potentially a slowdown in in tar spot as well or does tar spot do just fine in cool temps well i i think uh I think tar spot is actually going to do, I, I, I'm not sure it's going to slow down a lot with the lower temps that we've got in the forecast. Uh, it, it's quite comfortable in moderate, moderate temperatures. 
uh, which would include, you know, down to those mid teens that we're getting in some of these nighttime temps. The, again, the key with tar spot is leaf wetness and, and your duration of leaf wetness. Uh, if we, we had cool temps or warm temps and we had a dry canopy, I would not be, you know, I would comfortably say tar spot's going to slow down. Uh, right. But if we have foggy mornings and we have dew in the crop until noon, uh, I'm, I'm going to feel like there's a good chance that tar spot's going to continue to progress. And, and as, as Dale mentioned, it's, it's a polycyclical disease. So it just right. keeps pumping out spores and keeps traveling up the plant. So, right. uh, yeah, I'm not convinced. I, I, the cooler temperatures are definitely going to be influencing our corn crop, but less so, I think, the tar spot. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. Dale, you, you brought up a good point, um, and I, I want to make sure we talk about it here. There's two things I want to talk about, and then I want to talk about Jabril. But um, you mentioned the discussion that, of course, we talk about a fungicide pass, you know, protecting against the disease or suppressing the disease or, or it continuing. But of course, we've also got, you know, those stay green impacts, a healthier plant, perhaps, and, and standability could come in to play here, or, or perhaps with a later crop, how important are some of these other benefits going to be potentially for having protected this crop sooner? Well, I think the main role of fungicide that we don't always talk about, is, yes, we want to stop the disease, but the reason we want to stop the disease is let the plant make lots of sugar so it can fill the grain and not cannibalize itself. And once a plant starts cannibalizing sugar, there isn't enough sugar to keep the roots alive. And then when the roots die, they're an entry point for stock rot. And then that's where your standability issues come in. So, so there, there's, it's not just about this, this whole package of the stay green, stay green and keep the plant pumping out sugar. Because the cob is a dominant sink. It will not be denied. It will take, it will rob itself to right. fill that grain. And then you end up with a bunch of weak stocks. And we saw that in 2022 on farms that did not spray uh, the standability you walk into the field and you start walking across rows you're knocking corn plants over like you just you yeah. touch them they fall over so it's a it's a concern so it's uh yeah so it's all those things it's a package it's it's a management uh package to that we need to consider so mm -hmm. and john how worried would you be uh about so volunteer corn in soybean fields acting as a host for tar spot is it a concern absolutely i think the you know the fact that the, the tar spot doesn't really care where the corn plant is it's a host <laughs> it's going to infect it uh, we and we do grow some pretty fantastic volunteer corn in southwestern ontario so it, it it's a <laughs> It's no different than, you know, managing, managing weeds. Corn is a weed in a, in a, in a soybean field. And the, the fact that it can support tar spot means it's just going to continue to add inoculum uh, to our geography. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. All right. Um, I do want to switch gears. Unless, of course, what have we missed on tar spot? I think, I mean, some good questions about, and I think actually someone asked, okay, so aerial versus ground unit, what about helicopter versus drone? I will just put it out there. Do we know anyone doing research yet? Because I know it's not allowable for just anybody to do it, but do we have drone research happening on some of these fungicides? I believe there's some, uh, not a lot. And uh, so I don't know. So, so the question about a drone is, is what's the coverage? Uh, right. You know, so that's always the question mark. So I think there's been some, some question mark around that. Not going to slam them one way or the other. I just think it's, it, we need to do this research. We need to find out. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other thing with drones is, is capacity. Unless you're going to run a swarm of drones that can do 75 acres an hour. Uh, you know, it's just, it's just all those things. It certainly is novel. It's unique. I think it has applications in other areas in agriculture as well. But uh, yeah, I, I think uh, there has been some initial research done by permit, I believe. But don't hold me to that. I'm not 100%. Mm -hmm. It's just yeah, a good conversation, Dan. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not very familiar with it, with any research 
in Ontario uh, regarding it. I, I do know there's a, f- a fair bit of drone work being done with fungicides in, on the U.S. side of the border. Uh, yeah. They 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 will no doubt generate uh, you know some fairly robust data sets in that regard. I guess the one thing I would say you know aerial versus ground rig when it comes to fungicide volume volume counts from a coverage standpoint uh, and I'm I guess I would lean a little bit towards a ground unit but we also have to recognize that we we leave some crop in the field when we put a ground unit in at that growth right. stage because as, as good as these machines are, they still run over corn. And uh, and if you get out and walk in your field, you'll see <laughs> some of the, you know, some of the corn that they've yeah. knocked down. Yeah, the fallen soldiers. Although, and, and Dale, to your point, as you mentioned earlier, uh, when it's a small window and you've got a lot of acres to cover, it's probably going to be a multi-pronged attack anyway, well, right? So yeah, yeah you're well, going to be using the ground unit and helicopters as well. Um, well yeah. Plus, it looks yeah, really well, cool. Well, farmers have responded to the risk. Like the demand for spray has gone through the roof. The number of acres being covered has gone up exponentially. So, so this is so farmers are understanding the risk and wanting to take action on it. So, uh, capacity needs to be there, or uh, we leave yield on the table. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, there's also yes. Peter brings up the drop nozzles as well. I've seen these beluga drop nozzles. Uh, John, any any experience uh, using drop nozzles and and seeing any differences there? No, uh, no personal experience in the area that I cover, but I'm I'm a little bit familiar with the work that uh, Jason has done uh, with with. Uh, uh, with those devices and I've seen a little bit of the data and it, and it looks quite promising getting a directed stream onto those, onto the silks. Uh, that's certainly uh, important. I, I think the real challenge and, and Dale mentioned it earlier, you know, a, a pretty primary focus for us in Ontario has been jib. And this is your segue into jib. Thank but you, the, the, uh, you know, jib has been the primary focus because it, it's it's bit Ontario a couple of times over the yeah. uh, over the years, and getting fungicide on at the right time is very very key if it's going to be effective for for jib control. I'm I'm still of the personal opinion that we don't have enough research data on fungicide for jib control, and I would love. I would I would love for more of that to happen, but but it is what it is today, and I think that's a, that's a key driver. So a question there then: it where where for you are we missing a chunk of this? Is it is it that there's you know is it that because Dawn isn't necessarily the mycotoxin development is sort of separate from jib infection? Is it because we've got two forms of infection. Where's the question for you that really we're not answering? Twenty. I was in research 20 years ago and I did a, I did a paper internally and I said, we're going to have jib fixed in five years because we were mm. scoring it and screening Great for job. it and inoculating for it. And, and right. uh, that didn't happen. So didn't it work. it's, it's a number, it's a number of those things, Lindsay. A, jib is not a, it's not a simple disease. It's quite complex. And I would love to understand better the interaction between, uh, between the fungicides in terms of how they influence the, the fauna around the silks. I'm, I'm kind of excited about the whole biologicals business in terms of what it might do uh, when it comes to, to controlling jib, but that's kind of pie in the sky. Yeah. Yeah. Given a long enough timeline, John, we can do all sorts of pie in the sky. So we're just going to keep, yeah. we're going to keep yeah. going away. Bill, Bill may bring some reality to that. Story. Yeah, they're bring it crashing back down. Okay, so so let's, in talking about Jib, Dale, you've already sort of hit on one of the things that, of course, is so important is, you know, who is growing the crop and what is that? 
crop destined for, right? Because of course, uh, if we're talking about hogs um, or, you know, is it dairy cattle? Is it hogs? Is it beef cattle? Like, where is this going? These are the things we need to know. Um, that's, of course, a, a key thing. So now, Kevin, who is a dairy farmer, uh, he says a fungicide app is just beginning to become a thing in his area to control the mycotoxin, so the Dawn, um, created by the gibberella. So any idea on how much starch increase, if any, occurs because of fungicide application in silage analysis? Dale, I'll go to you on this one. Is it all about the Dawn or are we getting a better quality product when we're trying to target that gibberella control? Yes. That good? Oh, that good enough answer? No, I want more. <laughs> Kevin needs well, a full explanation yeah, of well, why. Well, well, of course, getting rid of reduce it can't get rid of. Let's let's talk about uh, suppression and and it's always incidence and severity. So let's reduce the risk. Right. This is about risk management, not risk elimination. So let's reduce the risk of mycotoxic contamination. So recent research has shown it's not just swine; it's it's poultry and it's dairy and beef and. It affects the autoimmune system in the plant and some other general health. So, yeah, so it's it's a question of uh, certainly gib ear rots will reduce yield, reduce grain quality. So, yeah, get rid of the, the degree of infection. You will improve your feed quality. I don't think that's a, a giant leap of logic. Uh, the thing that's frustrating with gib, and I go back to 2018, the infection window through the silk channel. So when, a, when you have a green silk, it plugs the cob. You can't get any infection from gib on a green silk. It's not till the silk turns brown and it shrinks back that allows the germinating spore to get in and colonize the tip of the cob. So, and even at that, it's like a 10 to 12 hour window of opportunity. And if the conditions are just perfect, right amount of moisture and the presence of the inoculum and the silk channel is open, you'll get, you'll get a beginning of infection. So in 2018, I was on a farm that grew the same hybrid two miles apart on opposite sides of the road. One field was absolutely hammered with Dawn and the other field, same hybrid, totally clean, just planted two days later. So the, the synchronization of the silk emergence, the presence of the disease, it was different. I've seen farmers with split planters, two different hybrids on the, on the planter, eight rows just absolutely polluted with, with ear rot and the other eight rows perfectly fine. Silk two days apart, right? So it's it, this complicates understanding how gib infects and which hybrid is more susceptible or not anybody's hybrid in my mind can be susceptible at any time if the conditions are just whatever they are at that point and i don't think art shashman is really a, a very knowledgeable person on this and i'm sorry to see him retire but i guess he's still around and he, he understands this disease forward and backwards and uh yeah so that's it's a very definitive set of, of situations that cause the infection to occur and some fields you get it some fields you don't and that's the frustrating part about it and of course once it develops it's not uniformly distributed in a, in, a, in, a, in a sample anyway so then you're aggravated by one sample's good the next sample isn't right so it's just uh, it's a lot of a lot of things so yeah i like john I, I like so when it comes to the feed industry what's the feed industry do so at the beginning of harvest nobody wants a high dawn corn Nobody's going to fill up a silo with 20 ppm dawn corn and the harvest begins. So they're going to put that aside until we learn how to use that. And that's what happened in 2018. We took all the good corn. Everybody contracts number two yellow. Nobody contracts number five corn. And so we had to have some farmers just wait to harvest until we found a home for high dawn corn, which we did eventually. Mind you, at a discount. Mm -hmm. But you just you just have to understand the disease. You have to roll with the punches. And and the thing is, uh, the feed company has ways of dealing with high dawn corn when they have to. They have all sorts of feed additives to sequester and keep it from being absorbed in the animal's gut. So the, the whole industry gets involved. The farmer certainly takes it on the nose, no question. It's it's mm -hmm. a quality and a discount issue. So I'm not trying to make light of that. But it's it certainly uh, the first step was after 2018 was all seed corn companies made an effort to uh, rank their susceptibility. So we saw a lot of susceptible hybrids leave the market. So that's helped us tremendously in reducing our risk. So that's husk cover, that's ear, ear orientation, that's dry down, um, thickness of husk cover, how many leaves on, on the cobs, all that stuff is is there. And does the does the husk cover the tip at 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 the uh, our R5, R6. Our, our so, yeah, so so we're seeing some physical attributes right. from corn, but I kind of like, I'm intrigued by John's comment, is I think the biologicals is likely is going to hold a secret, and, and we're always hopeful that genetics will play a role. Mm -hmm. So, so adding to that, John, you know, 
the importance of exactly that of, of I mean, Dale puts it in an interesting way, as opposed to, you know, selecting the rock stars that are great, getting rid of the ones that are not so great is almost just as important. That, that that's been every breeder's effort for the last hundred years. That's you, you screen, you screen a lot of material and you throw away all the bad stuff. And then you're in, you're left with what is the most commercializable, if that's a word. <coughs> sure it is. And, and I think every hybrid ends up coming to the end of its life for one reason or another. And, and you just, some last longer than others because they maybe don't experience that one environment that's going to cause them to go down. Mm -hmm. I, I, th I think the industry as a whole, I think all the companies have done a, you know, a pretty, pretty good job of trying to filter through uh, the, the, the high jib risk products. But if we happen to get another 2018 environment, we're going to see a fair bit of jib in Ontario. And I say that confidently because there, there's, there's a range of material out there and everybody, uh, ev everybody's going to experience it to some degree. So, so two things um, in prepping for the show. And I think I told Peter Johnson the story um, in prepping for the show. I went through many corn school videos that talk about Jibarella and all that sort of stuff. And we have one from 2018 earlier in the season. And we talked slightly about disease risk, but we were, you know, not too worried. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a good year. So this speaks to me to the importance of, you know, things can change or things can line up going forward that end up putting us in a position where we've got a really bad year uh, that maybe didn't start out that way. Um, but, but to that point, John, and maybe Dale, you can weigh in here. Some things are similar to 2018 um, potentially. <laughs> and so we could be looking at that concern. So I guess my question then to you, and I have a, a, a few others, and and Pete brings up a good point, and I did pull a clip uh, with Dave H Hooker that looks at some of Art Shaftsman's work about those later um, later developing plants. So I want to tackle that in a moment. Um, but what about this year worries you most still looking forward on the jib front and the dawn front? Well, I look at August 2018 and August 2023. They're not exactly the same, but we've had long periods of wetness. And, and what farmers need to realize as well, it's not just rainfall, it's dew and it's fog and it's high humidity. I've been in fields at one o'clock in the afternoon, my shirt's still getting wet. So we've had those conditions that kind of support that idea. I think that I'm hopeful of is after 2018, I think we'll see a low incidence, but a high severity. So if you can understand that, yeah, we got okay. we got rid we got a lot of the susceptible hybrids off the market, right? So we had farmers in 2018 grow all one hybrid, and it didn't work out for them. Yeah, you know, 18, 25, 30, 50 parts million a dawn, right, on thousand acres of corn. So we've seen that management risk management thing change multiple hybrids again. Yield has been king, standability has been queen, and I think now we, we have as many conversations about risk management with customers now on seed corn orders, and maybe John can speak to that as well, as we ever have, because we are looking at those, those susceptibility risks for, for Dawn, especially on our livestock customers, right? Mm -hmm. So I, 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 I'm worried that we have similar conditions for supporting infection, but I'm hopeful that we've got some of the... Uh, the hybrids uh, off off the market that were highly susceptible in 2018. I'm pretty confident we have. And so normally when we have uh, these kinds of infections, when you get an infection, it's really bad. Just hope you don't have a lot of them. Right. That's what I'm going to predict this year. Okay. John, is there anything about this year that worries you? Well, yeah, I, I, I think Dale, I think Dale has covered the primary, the primary concerns. I, I think, uh, the environment at flowering, uh, post flowering, uh, when we could experience natural infection was certainly conducive to infection. And, you know, if we have a, if we have a nice dry window post pollination, uh, that, 
risk of natural infection goes down. And then really all I'm worried about is maybe some Western bean cutworm infestations where we get some secondary infection. Uh, but for the most part, I, I wouldn't be too, too concerned. So, so that's, that was the first thing I'd be concerned about. I think the other, the other factor is, you know, we grow amazing corn in Ontario. We have, we have producers that are pushing the limits of this crop and gibberella ear rot, even though you consider it, it's a, it, it's a weak pathogen, but it loves, it loves aggressive corn management. It loves high fertility. It loves high populations and everything that a producer does to hit his yield targets or push his yield sorry, his or her yield targets, that is going to facilitate a higher risk, in my opinion, a higher risk of jib infection and higher bomb levels. And the sooner, if, if you do have jib, you need to get that corn crop out of the field as soon as possible. Mm-hmm. And of course, in Ontario, we have, we have, preferred to leave the corn in the field, let it dry naturally, save that money and harvest it later. But if you have jib and you have the potential for dawn, you need to get that crop out, get it dried quickly. Let's pause for just a moment because I want to come back to that and also to, to either second cobs, these sorts of things as well. Um, And uh, I just want to, of course, just pause for just a moment for our last read for our sponsors tonight. The Agronomist is brought to you by Adama Canada, The Corn School, and Real Ag Newsletters. Don't miss out on any of the content we publish. Whether you're looking for agronomy, current events, or industry news, our daily newsletters will bring you our most current pieces every morning right to your inbox. Visit realagriculture.com slash subscribe to get real and get connected. So Pete's tongue-in-cheek response is we should just quit managing corn for yeah. highest yields and jib will yeah. not I'm, be a problem. I, I, I saw that. Yeah, I deserve <laughs> that. That's fine. That's yeah. fine. But, I do like that you call it a wheat disease too. The That's truth of the matter is that nobody will, uh, not, none of us will stop trying to push That's higher right. corn yields. That's just never going to happen. And we're not going to. No, it's fine. So, okay. So one of the clips that I did pull, which if you want to head over to cornschool.com, you can find it there, but Pete brings it up as well. Um, we get, we get, sometimes we get uh, plants with a second ear. No, it's not going to make grain, but does it contribute potentially to Dawn? Um, Art Shaftsman's work does suggest, and, and this is what Dr. Dave Hooker was sharing, that a later emerging plant has a much higher dawn level risk than one that that is uniform and comes out at the same time so dale now that you've explained to me just how small of a window that that pollen uh that silk channel infection is i'm absolutely blown away but this starts to make a lot more sense in my mind then if we've got green silks happening again at another time you just widen that window for infection but but do we know or do we have an idea of why the higher jib? Is it just because the fungicide didn't get, <clears throat> get applied there? Well, like likely those late emerging cobs have got maybe, and they're further down the plant shielded by a bunch of leaves. So maybe they just didn't get a critical coverage uh, of, the, of the group three fungicide that they should be using. Or someone didn't use a group three fungicide, wasn't going to stop it anyway. So you got you to gotta understand what fungicides were used. And usually it's a group 11 and a group three together. Um, so I'll challenge that statement a little bit. Uh, in the practical world, I've had cases where the late emerging cobs were just fine. The first emerging cobs had the ideal scenario and they were loaded with non late emerging cobs weren't. So that happens as well. So it just speaks to this whole timing thing. But certainly, uh, I don't know enough about the, the, the disease development, but if, when I'm looking at some of these second cobs, there's absolutely no grain on them until you get down to the butt end of the cob. There's only like six ro- six uh, circles of corn there. So I don't know if there's even enough food 
to even support uh, yep. infection, right? So most of these cobs get reabsorbed into the main cob. We're, we're marginal on nitrogen supply, so that grain's going to pull whatever nutrients, and it's going to sacrifice that second cob. So I'm not – this year I'm not overly concerned. I can't say every field won't have a second cob, but some will. But from what I'm seeing, maybe John's got different observation, but uh, I'm not overly concerned this year about that second cob. John, do you ever no. worry? Well, do I ever worry? Did you? I love the tiller. <laughs> yeah. No, just in general. You, you seem like Sometimes. an easygoing guy. Now, I'm those tillers, certain. do you, do we really worry about those second cobs? Yeah. Well, I, I, you know, they do, they do present, uh, they do present some risk. I, I think, you know, Dale, Dale talked about the coverage. Of course, those later cobs are silking at a different time. So if, if the environment, if the environment is more conducive when that second ear is coming out, then the chance for infection is, is higher on that ear. I like to I like to try to envision being the mold. If you're the mold, you really like you like high moisture, and those secondary cobs have a tendency to be smaller, and yet they have a almost a full length husk on them. So they do have longer husk, tighter husk. They tend to stay wetter later in the season, so there's more uh, there's there's more moisture there for that disease to proliferate. And the longer that disease grows on the cob, the more potential for vomitoxin to be produced. Doesn't always happen that way, and I think that's one of the I think that's one of the struggles that we all have in terms of you know it, it it's not always A plus B equals C if You've got the infection, uh, but you don't necessarily have those high bombs. And then there's complicating factors because you've got trichothecenes and dawn and, and, and different toxins that affect right. uh, a, a, affect certainly animals. And I've had hog producers tell me that, you know, they have no problem feeding five part per million dawn corn out of this bin and three part per million corn out of this bin the hogs were refusing it. So there's other factors at play. And, and again, I'm, I mean, vomitoxin, that's a whole nother world, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, just John, really hogs. Yeah, well, go ahead, yeah. yeah, John bring up a good point. This whole trichothethene family of which Dawn is one, but there's T2 and HT2 and more. We test for Dawn because the Eliza kits were built to test for Dawn. Yeah. We also know the other toxins are present because that's just the nature of the of the of the beast. And uh, so John's point about five ppm is fine, three pm not. It's a cocktail. That's uh, so how much T two and HT two is in that low dawn corn. So we we've, we've known this for a long time. I used to run a lab and test this stuff all the time, and farmers would just be crazy that well, how can two ppm be so bad? And I'm feeding six ppm, the hogs are just fine. Well, it was only dawn, and dawn by itself is tolerable. Don plus T2 and HC2, not so much. So, yeah. yeah. So, so further to that point, and, you know, we're here creeping up to the end of August. Um, as you said, Dale, I, I think you're the first person to tell me a date on when they figure black layer is going to happen. I've heard a couple of people guessing. So I'm writing it down and we'll check we back that. in a couple of weeks. Yeah, we'll see where we're at. Everybody can start putting their over under on, on Dale's time. But, um, the importance then exactly that john to that point um of getting that crop out of the field recognizing that that if you've got gibberell infection if you've got conditions for development really you stand to lose more by letting it dry in the field than paying for drying right john uh, i abs yeah you're right it it's a uh, it it's pretty simple math the longer you leave that corn in the field and allow gibberella to to actively grow on the cob it's going to continue to pump toxins into the corn and and so and we've seen anecdotally we haven't done trials on it but anecdotally producers that are very aggressive and as soon as it gets to 30 percent they're taking it out of the field I would say that they run into less issues on a high VOM year or a high dawn year than those that want to wait 
and get it down into the low twenties or, you know, down to 20. Uh, it, that's maybe a project somebody should try to do and, and generate some data on. That's, that's the mark of a great agronomist episode. We usually come up with at least one to two masters or PhD projects. So whoever Perfect. would like that one, that one's Perfect. up for grabs. Um, yeah, I like that there, Dale. That, so if you know anybody who's looking to do a project, there we go. Um, as, and Pete says, toxic soup is how John, John Wincho, am I saying that right? Describes the toxin mix in silage for dairy cows. And let's face it, when we're, fe when we're feeding ruminants, we do have to think about their rumens and the magic that they do, but also that they're full of microbes. And then when we're dealing with hogs, we're dealing with monogastrics that can't necessarily do all the magic that rumens do. So we really do have to think about where is this crop going to end up? and what we're most concerned about. So, well, uh, and, yeah. And the, the worst kind of weather at post at harvest time is warm days and cold nights, because that's what triggers the dawn accumulation. Right. So it's uh, so every day you have uh, warm days and cold nights, you just keep building dawn every day, so. All right, put it on the calendar. Let's see how it goes. We'll okay. check back and see how it turns out. Let's hope you're right, both of you. I love the positivity on the where we've come from 2018 and that even if conditions were right or continue to be we're going to be leaps and bounds ahead so we'll see we'll see how we do we'll, we'll check the report card this fall all right uh, john thank you so much for joining me and just a quick shout out john will be joining me on real ag radio on thursday for the farmer rapid fire um, i'm hosting the show all week so uh, you can hear from john later in the week as well uh, so thanks john so much for joining me thanks lindsay all right. And Dale, thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate it. And thank you for being so prepared. I almost feel like I didn't have to be here. You guys could have just run the whole thing. Oh, we, we can't do this without you, Lindsay. Don't ever think that. <laughs> nope. uh, all Never. right. Okay. Never. All right. Thank you, everyone who joined us in the comments as well. Great questions. Uh, wonderful seeing you here. If you do collect those CU credits, uh, head on over to realagriculture.com slash agronomists. Uh, make sure you let us know that you watched. And uh, we'll see you next week, 8 p.m. Eastern, right here on The Agronomists. Cheers, everybody. Bye now. Cheers.